Good evening, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed your meal. Uh, I would like to once again thank Clearwater for this beautiful um, main event that we just experienced. And uh, my name is Masha Kennedy. I'm the Director of Partnerships at the Public Policy Forum. Thank you again for, to all of you for being here this evening. And before we begin the next portion um, of our evening, uh, I would like to take the time to thank the contributors, um, the very generous contributors to the Frank McKenna Fund. The Frank McKenna Fund was established um, a few years ago, and it is a way for us to honor um, Mr. McKenna's impact, past and present and, and future, in, in this great work of policy that we all care much so, so much about. And uh, if you don't see your name um, in our publications or on the screen, we are absolutely, uh, will welcome you with open arms to continue to support the legacy of this fund and uh, all of the additional work that the Public Policy Forum delivers. And it is my absolute honor and pleasure to uh, introduce the next two gentlemen who will carry us through a fireside chat. Please welcome um, Edward Greenspan, the CEO and President of Public Policy Forum, and the Honorable Frank McKenna. have three pitchers of water for us, so uh, yeah. I guess we're gonna be up here longer than, uh, than we think. Yeah. Is, is somebody gonna give me like a, a five minute, you know, get off the stage? Don't let Frank see it. You want me to be louder. I, is that better now? Okay, good. Um, uh, your, your, your team is, uh, wants me to be louder, so. Okay. Right. Okay, so here we are, loud enough. <laughs> Thanks for being with us this evening. Yeah. Uh, very grateful uh, uh, for that, and thank you for uh, your support for the uh, Frank McKenna Awards. Now, um, we both know that uh, there's no policy without politics. Right. Uh, but there seems to be politics without policy. Uh, that happens. But let's start with some policy issues, and then we'll kind of move into, uh, into politics and the uh, back half of the conversation. So we've talked a lot of here, uh, people have referred to uh, the labor market, the future of work, issues like that. These have been issues that concerned you since you were premier. Um, how's that going? <clears throat> that was a big question, uh, so t I'll take a minute. If you don't mind, just before then, I, I want to uh, congratulate the five winners. Uh, I know them all, either personally or by reputation, and uh, they're, they're, they're just sensational. Mm -hmm. So congratulations, Laurel. Congratulations, a great do uh, job. and. Uh, and I want to thank you and the Public Policy Forum for creating this, uh, this extraordinary honor for me in my name. Uh, it, what's really, really good is that I'm alive uh, <laughs> <laughs> to enjoy it. Uh, I just I can't stand the idea of the Frank McKenna Memorial uh, something or other. So, so, so you, okay. you, you really don't know whether you might enjoy something afterwards, too. No, but I mean, but yeah. why take the chance, right? That, that's yeah. a whole different public policy issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, but on, on, on this, I, I, I just want to say that I uh, am really pleasantly uh, impressed and pleased with the evolution, even over the last several years, uh, of what I think is the biggest issue facing Atlanta, Canada, and that's access to labor, uh, writ large. And uh, I think, we're talking about public policy, one of the best pieces of public policy I've seen out of the Government of Canada, and the most focused, two things which they're not historically uh, so good at, uh, was the Atlantic Immigration Pilot, uh, working with the Premiers and the Regional Ministers, but uh, it's targeted, which is a good thing. It responds to a regional need, not necessarily a national need. I mean, 65% of all immigrants coming to Canada go to Toronto, so they don't need a a pilot program, and it's been adaptable. You pointed out that uh, the issue of spouses of immigrants, they've re responded to that. Students uh, gravitating out of the universities, they've responded to that. So I really, uh, I really find, uh, find this, this is a, an example of public policy responsive to uh, uh, a, a very dire need. And the need is very dire. We, uh, we all see the statistics about our our population, which has been in decline, 
and which has been aging, and both of those are demographic death sentences, as you know. Uh, I first got turned on to demography when I read Boom, Bust, and Echo uh, by Dr. Foote, and uh, I've always believed it, that it would eventually overwhelm all of our other uh, issues, uh, and it took a lot longer. It took a long time for you, I guess, you know, in politics particularly, surplus labor would have been the issue, not, uh, not deficits of labor. Ed, you're dead right? on the money. We, we did a report on demography. I got so exercised about this. In 1995, we had the legislature do a report. Joan Kingston headed up the committee on demography and the challenges. But the problem was, and you put your finger on it, we, we didn't have a burning platform. And trying to solve for a problem that nobody knows you have is one of the hardest things in public life. And nobody has really appreciated the fact that we had a major demographic time bomb coming. But more laterally, and I give full marks to leaders, both in business and in government, uh, in, in, in uh, public policy areas of government and the political leadership. In the last number of years, they've responded with extraordinary uh, vigor. We have population secretariat set up in all the provinces. Uh, ACOA sees this as one of its core mandates. Uh, the Minister of Immigration was in last week to my office just to talk about progress and what more we needed to do. It was really good to see and uh, some terrific work. Uh, David Campbell wrote a, a very provocative article recently in New Brunswick talking about how we needed to get to a million people really to sustain our, 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 our province, uh, which would mean almost tripling the number of people that we're bringing in. And the other thing that's changed, Ed, I is the reaction of our public who were for many years extraordinarily resistant to the idea of, of immigration and who are now embracing so, so, it. So you think that's flipped? I don't say that it's flipped all the way, but there's a big change. I find every community now has local uh, citizenship councils and welcoming committees and so the the whole region has started to buy into the idea. I still think we, we've got two other legs to the stool uh, to try to deal with our issues. More immigration is one. Secondly, uh, innovation. Uh, and, uh, and, and one of the most recent articles I, I read, John Childbeck wrote about New Brunswick needing 120,000 workers over the next 10 years. We can't get all of those from immigration, so we need more in innovation in, uh, in our industries, that would be number two. And number three, and the one that deserves and demands a public policy response, is a relook at all of those programs that were introduced out of a surfeit of generosity, but have now become traps for our citizens. And I'm talking- uh, well, one, has, one of them has two initials, I bet. One of them has two initials, okay. EI and welfare. And one of the biggest, forces of resistance against immigration are people saying, look, my Johnny or Jill can't get a job. Why are we bringing people in? And we unfortunately have not been able to figure out uh, how we get the incentives right for Johnny and Jill. Uh, and uh, blame us for it. Uh, these are people that are often underskilled and just haven't been given the tools and have taken advantage of uh, what's been on offer uh, from the system. And, Though that is an underrepresented group in the labor force now in our region, and, and we need to get them. Okay, well, let's come back to that group, but let's, let's stick with uh, immigrants, newcomers to the region for a moment. I, I, I said earlier that, you know, it's about 50-50 uh, um, uh, retention and, uh, and, and departure after five years. So what do you think, and, and, and in Ontario, that number is 85 you know, percent retention, I think. Uh, so what does this region need to get from 50 to 85? What do you have to yeah. do? I think we need roots. Uh, immigrants go where immigrants are. And, uh, and we all, we all want to be comfortable in terms of our religion, our foods, our culture. And, and so we need to lay down roots in communities uh, so that more people will be attracted and stay. Uh, that's part of it. And secondly, the communities have to be even more accommodating and welcoming and, uh, and creating multicultural councils and just doing all the things that we're so good at here in Atlanta, Canada. They don't have to work at it in Toronto. People just want to go there because you can find 700 Greek restaurants if you're Greek. You can find 1,000 restaurants if you're Italian. 
and I'm, I'm underestimating those numbers. So, so we have to do more. And I find everywhere employers are bringing people in and they're taking that seriously, the settlement and the retention of workers and their families quite seriously. So um, is it perfect? No, but I'd say that uh, the dial is being moved on that. Okay, so let's talk for a minute about if there's, um, you know, if, if you were the premier, if you were uh, selling businesses to come here to invest here, uh, as you once did, and as you know, to some extent, you obviously still do. What's what's the secret sauce? What's the special mm -hmm. sauce? We heard, um, um, you know, from Pratt and Whitney earlier. Well, you weren't here, so I'll I'll I'll, I'll say it that you know the job satisfaction. You heard the second part of it all about the the, the plant the and the job satisfaction being better than any plant that they have in the world, yes, right? I heard and that. The, and the turnover is very very yeah. low. Yeah. So so, what's the secret sauce that that would attract uh, more business investment? Well, when we were selling, uh, David Campbell's here, he would know, we were in large measure selling availability of labor. Uh, and we did have a lot of labor, no doubt about that. And, and at a very competitive cost. Uh, so we were selling that. Um, but I would say that's changed dramatically now. Uh, it wouldn't be so much that. Uh, I mean, some of the assets we do have are universities, uh, 13 across the region. Uh, uh, but but really deep in, uh, in a number of core strengths and very responsive. So if you bring an industry in and want certain kind of workers, our community college network or our universities can, can, can prepare you. Uh, the agility of our decision making, that used to be one of our keys in New Brunswick. We, we could literally have a deal done within a day or two and people would be talking at every level, Fran the Francis McGuire's of the world, the ministers, myself, whoever it, whatever it took to do the deal we would do it. That agility is important. Hunger. People go where they're wanted, and you have to let people know that they're wanted. And then, uh, and now labor is turning into a two-edged sword because we don't have as much of it, but we do have access to labor, and that's starting to work for us. We, we brought, I wouldn't say, say that too loudly amongst my colleagues here, but uh, at TD, but uh, on a hope and a prayer, we, we brought a thousand jobs to Moncton. They were convinced in Toronto that I knew what I was talking about. I was going to say the vice <laughs> uh, chair, yeah. That okay. we could get the people. And guess what? We are. It's not me. It's the people who are working at the center, the immigration uh, that's coming in, people returning to Nebraska. These are skilled jobs. This is their finance back office. Pretty critical to the future of the bank. And we have the largest component uh, in that operation so far of diversity of anywhere in the bank. These are people from countries all over the world of all different origins and languages. It's, it's wonderful to see. Right. And so if you build it, they will come, I think. And in our case, I think we're proving that we built something uh, powerful and people are coming. And how important is it that, um, uh, that a lot of this growth and a lot of uh, the foundation come from within the region? That these, you know, that ownership and, uh, and entrepreneurship originates uh, here with, uh, with people from the region? Well, I think, it, I think it's critical. We're the only ones that'll solve our problems. Um, you recall, well, perhaps you wouldn't, but for decades, I've been talking about uh, the need to reform our social programs so they become a trampoline, not a trap, and all of that. Sadly, I do recall this, because uh, decades I have to. <laughs> <laughs> right, but so Stephen Harper comes out and talks about a a, dec a, a culture of, what was it, negativity or something in Atlantic Canada? And he gets hammered for it. Well, he's an outsider telling us, I, I, don't, think that, uh, I don't think that goes down as well as people within our region talking about our issues and our problems. And so we, uh, we, need, we need to surface this ourselves. And, and I think the uh, uh, immigration pilot is a, is a response to demand from our region. It wasn't Ottawa telling us what we needed. It was our region telling Ottawa and Ottawa listening. So we need more of that. And, uh, and, and I, right now, I, I think that our population is really energized and motivated. We all know we have some issues. And uh, I'm, I'm just amazed at the number of people that are putting their shoulder to the wheel. OK, so let's, let's change gears and talk for a minute about uh, energy projects, which is something else, and, and resource projects, generally, that you've been uh, uh, very involved with and, uh, and I think frustrated uh, about the ability to, uh, um, to get certain things done. 
Um, recently, you know, we haven't built pipelines in the, in the country. We do have an LNG Canada, uh, you know, major, you know, $40 billion investment uh, occurring. Do you see, um, do you see this, this turning or changing in any way, or, are we just, or do you feel we're stuck? Well, I think it's both. Uh, there, there, the, uh, any polling firm would tell you the level of support for energy has improved pretty significantly. Um, but we're still stuck with a system that is designed to, to block projects rather than to, uh, to approve projects. And we do have some uh, green shoots. The LNG terminal on the West Coast would be one. Uh, Trans Mountain, depending on the decision next month, could be another one. Uh, we've, we've got uh, other pipelines stuck in limbo. There's a, an LNG project uh, on the St. Lawrence that has some lakes. But overall, it's not a good news story. And, uh, uh, and it's fr very frustrating to me. I blew my brains out on Energy East. Uh, you know, I thought it was a good idea and spent a lot of my uh, last few years working on it. And we couldn't even get through the regulatory process. The regulatory process was so burdensome that the project proponent, TransCanada, had spent over a billion dollars without even getting to the hearing stage. You, there's no private sector company that is going to expose its shareholders to that kind of uh, risk. And so we've made it so hard that it's almost impossible to get things done. And around the world, people look at Canada. They admire enormously the culture of our country, our civility, our legal system, and everything else. But in terms of getting stuff done, it's risk off. They're not going to invest in Canada because we can't get stuff done. That's the permit economy. The non-permit economy in the country is doing fine. So just let me square this up a, a bit, if you don't mind, Ed, because I know there are all sides to this de debate, but I think we should all be on the, on the, on the same side at the end. I'm, I'm the chairman of a, of, of a clean energy company that's the biggest in North America, maybe in the world. Uh, and yet I believe that we need a balance between the traditional energy sources and green energy until we gradually bend the curve and get more and more towards renewable uh, energy sources. I don't think that those, those uh, that oil and gas in Canada should be the only one that's shut in while we see despotic regimes all over the world uh, pumping oil and gas as quick as they can. And furthermore, Canada, in my view, is at the very top of the food chain in terms of introducing innovation, of setting rigorous standards, of dealing with methane, of water utilization, uh, carbon capture, if we weren't doing all of this innovation, nobody on the planet would be doing it. In the United States, it's just drill, baby, drill. And I can tell you, in Nigeria and Saudi Arabia, they don't give a rat's ass about the environmental issues that we do. So we're bringing all of the science to the world. And, uh, but, but, but maybe drill, baby, drill is an easier message than energy and the environment. Yeah. Energy and the environment. It's, it's hard for people you know, on, who are pro-energy development or who are you know, pro-environmental controls and worried about climate change to square those two things, so. Yeah, I think we're, we're finding that it is very hard. I personally think that they're very compatible objectives, and I think they're imperative objectives. It's, it's a scandal for a country, as blessed as ours, to not be able to get either oil or gas to market totally trapped in the basins, to the point where we're losing $30 billion a year of money out of your pockets, to Donald Trump in the United States of America. This would, if we care about a national pharmacare program, this would pay for it. Uh, child care, this would pay for it. More money for doctors, nurses, health care, this would pay for it. It's, it's, it, you could, this amount of money would allow us to pay off the deficit and have 20 billion left over. It's ridiculous the money that we are wasting as a country uh, by leaving all of our oil and gas captive to a single market. So I don't States. want to be partisan about this because we can say both the Harper government and the Trudeau government didn't get this done. Um, you know, how would you get it done? Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's a good argument, but that argument uh, doesn't seem to be winning. No, and in fairness, uh, the current government's having a very hard time. Uh, but under uh, Harper's government, not a molecule of oil or gas was moved either. Uh, and it's both, by the way, oil and gas that are both trapped. So. Uh, my, the, the project that I'm working on now that I think has got lots of flaws and, and, and lots of, of refinement to be done 
is the idea of turning this into another national project of the equivalent of the Trans-Canada Highway or the railroad system, making it a national a project de société, a, a project for the entire country. This is like a corridor kind of concept. This is the idea of creating an energy corridor from the Atlantic to the Pacific. In Atlantic Canada, we're shut out of the nation's riches of oil and gas. Right now, our, in, our local gas supply uh, is, is finished. We can't get uh, oil. We, we have 700,000 tons uh, or barrels a day of oil coming in from some regimes that we should be ashamed to be doing business with. And, uh, and meanwhile, our Western oil can't find a market. I, I, no other country in the world would put up with this. So yeah, my idea is to create a national energy corridor sponsored by the government of Canada, using the residual powers in the Constitution, peace, order, and good government, or national works and undertakings, a right of way that would bring oil and gas and hydro and even fiber optics across the country that would have a significant ownership in, with Indigenous people. They would be owners of this. Uh, and that we would toll in some way. It may be that every user pays a toll that would go to renewable resources or environmental technologies. So that we would do it in the Canadian way. We would do it right. And then if somebody wants to use that right of way, they would not have to go through zero to 100 I a regulatory process. They may end up uh, having a very truncated process for their, their particular molecules or electrons, as the case might be. I think that somebody someday should run an election on this. Uh, it's like free trade. It's such a big idea that it needs a national consensus. There almost seems to be a party desperate to change the channel with a new narrative and that you, yeah. you know, talk to from time to time. I don't yeah. know. Well, I, yeah, no, I tell them that. I don't know if they're biting on that. They, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty controversial idea. It is. Controversy sometimes is better than uh, negativity, but uh, yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's, it, that's an idea. By the way, this would also go north. It could be to Hudson's Bay. You know, there'd be different loops uh, that would take energy and uh, hydro and everything in different directions. But the overall idea is that, is that this is a, a national asset and, and we do not have to spend the next 20 years trying to get approval for it. So. Okay, so that's east-west. Yeah. Let's just go north-south for a second. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a, a trade agreement uh, supposedly uh, with, uh, with the United States uh, called USMCA or CUSMCA or the new NAFTA or it goes by many, uh, many identities. Uh, what's going to happen with that? Well, I think, I think it'll ultimately get ratified, but before then it'll be dramatic, drama that will be as significant as that with the China-US uh, thing. That's just the way things get done in the United States. I think it'll get done because uh, both parties there uh, don't want to do this, but they're motivated. Trump would sooner have no trade agreement at all. Uh, I've never well, seen. Well, maybe the pressure's off. I mean, he hasn't no. put a new tariff on Canada for a few months. Yeah, he's had it on for a long time. I, it, I haven't heard the news today, but we, we may have steel Talk or aluminum so. lifted today or tomorrow. Yeah. We're right at the at the crux on that. Um, so, but here's the motivation that's political in the United States. Not that the entire United States doesn't matter, it does. Everything matters. But California really doesn't matter, New York doesn't really matter, Texas doesn't really matter. It comes down to three or four or five states. Uh, in fact, if the Democrats, the Democrats had three million more votes than the Republicans, and yet they lost dramatically in the Electoral College. If they'd have won Pennsylvania and Michigan, which they used to own, it would be tied. Right. So those, that's what's in play, three or four or five states. Now those states, Trump, they love Trump fighting for them on the tariff side of things, uh, but it's now starting to grate right into their secondary industries. So the, the primary steel manufacturers might like what he's doing, but the people who use steel in their production don't. And it's really starting to hurt. More importantly, it's hurting the farmers all through that region because Mexico has put on a 25% tariff on US agriculture. So Iowa and Ohio, those states, are telling Trump, you fix this or we aren't voting for you again. Okay, so let's go quickly. And those are, by the way, you know, uh, future work states, I suppose. Those are states that are economically anxious uh, about, uh, you know, the, the work disruption they've yeah. had, interestingly enough. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, you can see, you know, the populist consequences uh, of that, whatever you may think. You know, it, play, it, it yeah, plays but, itself out politically. But let me, let me speak to that. 
Those are states that Trump and others have convinced uh, have lost jobs to Mexicans and immigrants. They've lost jobs in their primary manufacturing, uh, five million of them, 85% are to robots and innovation, not Mexicans. Uh, and yet that anxiety is what fuels their anger. So that's on the Republican side, but on the Democrat side, they need to win those states. Well, I want to talk, because I, I want to talk about the so, uh, Democratic side. So the they end. have to Let's, speak to that audience yeah. as well. So uh, there's uh, uh, 22 uh, uh, candidates uh, for the Democratic nomination. Right. Uh, some of them may be robots. I can't keep track of the entire group. Um, uh, who do you think, who stands out in that crowd for you as, as, as somebody who will be, you know, politically attractive and competitive in an election campaign? Right. Uh, so... At this stage in the last campaign, Obama was 30 points behind Hillary Clinton. Uh, in the one before that, Bill Clinton wasn't even on the charts as a potential candidate. So the answer is we do not know. Uh, it, it could be better or work could come through, uh, Kamala Harris, any of these people. But if you were just looking at it on the basis of where you need the votes, you would say Joe Biden and Amy Kubachar, for example. Pennsylvania She's from, and Minnesota. Right, exactly. He's Scranton, Pennsylvania, working class. The Democrats have to get the unions back in their fold. Joe is a union guy through and through. Amy Kubachar is a Midwesterner uh, with Midwestern sensibilities. Is Joe Biden too old? No, no, he's not too old. <laughs> <laughs> has he got an age somewhat similar to yours? I don't know. What is no, that? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. You're, you're a young man compared yeah, to no, Trump. I, well, I'm certainly younger than Trump. Yes. Uh, but